It was 32 years ago that I first got into this field. How did I get into this field? Uh, by accident, sort of like the monkey who fell out of the tree. Uh, my company, which I had at the time, was involved up until 1956 in very extensive network radio programs, which means dramatic programs for radio nationwide and overseas. And in 1956, we had the choice of whether we converted all the way into television. And so we had started to do so until we discovered a very interesting thing. Now, we had been doing these radio programs for many years. And what we discovered was that it was like seeing a movie all over again. It was as this this is where we came in, because we were taking exactly the same thing that we had done eight to ten years earlier and putting a picture to it. It was nothing more to us than radio with a picture. So we did not think that we wanted to go through this all over again. There must be something better to do than to go into television. And we had already two quiz shows in television and found that this was nice, but there must be something better. So, uh, as the head of the company, and knowing in, in uh, American language you have something that says you pass the buck, the buck ends with the president of the company, the responsibility, as does the authority. So, I decided we would try something else, and being very professional in sound, we naturally began to think of some way to use sound as a new means of, a new direction for our company. And what we first came up with and started conducting and in our research and development division of our company was how to help people learn while they are asleep. Very interesting parable that all the way back in 1956 we started conducting studies how to do this. And the first problem was, is how to get people to sleep. Because you can't take a subject and say, now, go to sleep. You have to, and you do not want to give them uh, chemicals or drugs to go to sleep, because that won't serve the purpose. So we began to use sound to help people to get to sleep. And that's how we first began to get into the technology of what we have since become. Uh, but along the way, uh, a very interesting thing took place. Uh, in that research pattern, I was the chief subject because I demanded it because I was very curious. So as the chief subject in all of these patterns of uh, finding ways to help people go to sleep by sound use, uh, <laughs> evidently something, I absorbed something because in 1958, then, I had this great, frightening, terrifying change take place in my life. And uh, I have written about this, as you know, in several books, and that's very, I guess, common knowledge, even uh, throughout the world, because the books have been translated into various languages. But simply put, at that time, I began to experience uh, moving out of my body. and. Uh, that was uh, uh, the final thing of uh, something that had begun a year at least or more before that time. I began to have, quote, dreams about, and I was an airplane pilot, so you can understand how that would take place. I began to have dreams about taxiing to the runway on an airport and getting the plane off the ground, and once I got it off the ground, that I would look up, and here are all these wires. It was as if one were flying down the street, and there were all these power lines overhead and telephone lines, and you couldn't find a hole to get out of it. And that dream had gone on, uh, a recurring dream, for at least a year. And then, shortly before this 
big thing took place in 58. I also began to experience a funny kind of vibration. And I went to my, it was as if my body were shaking, but there was no feeling of shaking. It was just internal. And I went hurrying to my favorite doctor, and he examined me and says, oh, you are working too hard, you are stressful, but there's nothing wrong with you. Go uh, take a pill and relax or something. Well, not necessarily being a pill taker, that did not work too well. But in any event, after many times, like 25 or 30 more times of experiencing this vibration, I thought, well, and fighting to get out of it is the point. I just pull myself away from this vibration. Uh, the next step was, well, this is I, this will never get anywhere. I might as, I'm too frightened about it. If it's going to kill me, let it kill me. So with that in mind, uh, one particular afternoon when I was lying down, I, I said, all right, fine. And the vibration came. If it's going to kill me, let it kill me. So I waited and waited and waited. And after a while, after about five minutes, it faded away, and I was still alive. So I thought, ha, ah, now I know it won't kill me. So I'm on safe ground. So after that, I began to simply let it happen and wait that five minutes so I could do something. And on this one famous night, as we're in 1958, I was lying in bed on a Friday night, uh, waiting for this vibration to end so I could go to sleep. And as I was lying there, thinking about what I was going to do the next day while this vibration got through doing what it was supposed to do, I was thinking how nice Saturday morning was going to be because we had had what we call a cold front come through and there would be strong northwest winds and there would be great thermal action. So being much into sailplanes and gliders at that time, the soaring was going to be tremendous. And as a result, this was my sense of great uh, joy and anticipation as I was waiting for this vibration to end. And as I waited and waited and, and thought how nice this is going to be, suddenly I felt something bumping against my shoulder. And that, of course, is uh, part of the history when I discovered that what I was bumping against was the ceiling of my bedroom. And that bumping uh, turned around and I did not know where I was until I saw this funny sort of a fountain coming out of what I thought was the floor. And I thought, where am I? This is a funny kind of dream. And I looked more closely and there thought there's something terribly wrong. This is not a fountain. This is the chandelier, uh, the light fixture coming out of the ceiling. So I looked around and sure enough, down there in the bed below me, was a, a, my wife lying in bed, and beside her was a man in bed. And I says, what kind of dream is this? This is a strange dream. Who, whom would I think of who would be in bed with my wife? And I said, I can't resist finding out. So I moved a little closer, and then this great shock came over me because the person in bed with my wife was me. And then the fright came, the terror. What am I doing? Am I dying? Let me get back quick, something. So I went through the air like this, swimming through the air to get back to the body, and bang, and got back in the body. That was the first time that I, in turn, found out. And then very quickly I sat up and everything was quiet. I was, I, my heart was racing because I was excited, but everything else was fine. My wife's asleep, quiet, nothing, no problem. So that is exactly how it began, all the way back in 1958. It took uh, many visits to a doctor to find out that I did not have a brain tumor. It took reassur reassurances from a, uh, a very well-known psychiatrist friend who said, I can certify that you're sane, Bob. I said, well, what's the matter with me? And what's this thing that's happening to me? And uh, he said, well, I think that you are doing what is known as conscious dreaming. And I looked at him and I said, what, what's conscious dreaming? He says, I don't know, I just made it up. And I said, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I then got together with my 
psychologist friend, and I said, Brad, uh, what do I do about this thing? He says, oh, that's easy. I says, what? He says, they do it in India all the time. They, they know all about it in India. And I said, well, what? What should I do then? He says, well, I would, I would think you should go to India and uh, study under a guru and live in an ashram until you know all about it. And I said, well, how long would that take? And he said, oh, probably 10 or 20 years. I said, 10 or 20 years? What about my business? What about my mortgaged house? What about my wife and my two children? He says, oh, this is important. And I looked at him very in the face, and I said, Brad, if this were you, what would you do? And he looked at me with this. I said, he says, Robert, he says, it's not happening to me. It's happening to you. And he waved goodbye. <laughs> so that was the response of that beginning. And being of a stubborn variety, and knowing that I did not have a brain tumor, knowing that physically I was all right, and the two people that I trusted most in the, in the uh, mental health field uh, knew me so well that they said, oh, you have no mental problem. What does one do? Uh, so the natural response that I had in my way of thinking, being a Western mind, I couldn't see going uh, to India and spending 10 years uh, living in an ashram. That would not be very comfortable for me. And also, that's not the way I think. I'm a Western mind. So being very stubborn, what I did is to turn around and establish a research and development division in my company, taking the one that we had and moved it over in this other direction to find out what's happening to me or find out something so that I, in turn, could uh, have some answers for me. So it was a very selfish motivation and in the beginning. It was nothing noble or uh, wanting to help the world or humankind, not that at all. I needed the help. I had a company that could spend R&D funds to do this, and that's how it began. And it, a footnote, bear in mind that it took a full year after this first took place for me to finally come to the conclu conclusion that this was real, that it was not a dream, that it was not an hallucination, that it actually took place. Because my left brain, my in intellect, my an analytical part of me had to be knowing this, not believing it. And it took not a great uh, adventure or a, a great something that took place. It was an accumulation of one verification after another, again and again and again. And after a while, I said, myself my brain, my, my left brain, my total self, had to say, yes, this is real. There's too much evidence. Never mind the world, but for me. Mm -hmm. And that's how it began. Bob, after you began this, uh, this investigation into your own experiences, out of your own need to understand what was happening, out of that came hemisync. Could you tell us how the the information about these the influence of these sound patterns with the kind of experience that you were researching how did that connection get made for you well again first and foremost i was the prime subject uh, that that we're going all the way back to when uh i was in new york and had offices in new york and had a house in westchester county and I secretly put a laboratory on our property in Westchester because New York somehow felt too noisy. So I, we had this R&D program and built into uh, a 25 acre place up in Westchester County. Uh, it started very simply. We already knew how to put people to sleep. So then it began uh, to say, well, what? is this and how are we doing this and we started with a very sound scientific base of using uh, uh, sine waves that replicated the brain waves in the human mind the human brain to in turn induce this sleep well it didn't take much more pattern searching to determine 
that if we adjusted those into areas that we didn't had not looked at before, we would begin to find something else. And sure enough, we did. And it was all the way back there in 1960 that we first began to use what we have called in recent years frequency following response. And that's where, uh, that's different from hemisync. It's different from uh, a binaural beat type. This you can hear in open air. It doesn't require headphones to have maximum ability to listen to it. And we use that very, very broadly for a number of years. In terms of the hemisync process itself, uh, the hemisync process didn't really take place until the 70s, and by that time, we had uh, we had moved over to Charlottesville, Virginia, and gotten into cable television, and uh, that was the new thing to do as against radio stations, and we had through an association with about by that time I had accumulated a, about eight or nine different engineers and scientists and doctors in Virginia and we as a group it was nothing again mystical and magical we decided that would be the good way to do it to create a binaural beat and that's how Hemisync was born mm -hmm. and that is you know how it works I'm sure that's by setting one kind of signal say a hundred hertz signal in this ear and then 104 hertz over here and the differential that 4 hertz is synthesized by the mind the brain you can't hear it it's too low in frequency to hear but it is very effective to get that 4 hertz which is a brain wave frequency into the human mind Bob, what is the usefulness of hemisync in exploring different states of consciousness? In exploring different states of consciousness, uh, hemisync, uh, first of all, is tremendously valuable for one reason, and that is that it is it's not like a drug, it's not like a chemical. Uh, it is a sound, and as it as a sound, it in turn uh, it doesn't invade the body, as it were. It's not even like electrical stimulation where you force the body to do things by electricity. What it also means is that the mind can accept it or reject it. In other words, it's not something that forces itself into you like this. It says here, and it is. So the applications are so broad that we really don't know all of them. They're, we uncover new ones all the time. Uh, let's take the extremes. You can use hemisync to keep you awake, totally focused attention, wide awake and alert. And over here, you can put a person to sleep, into natural sleep. And the, in between are all of these many, many different ways, different states of consciousness that hemisync can be used yeah, to perform things. And you, let's go to the wake stage, first of all. You can be super awake. Now, what do we mean by, say, super awake? Intense focus of attention, concentration, so that you, all of your attention is focused on, say, a book or something like this. And by that focusing, you achieve much greater retention and much greater understanding just as you do focus your attention but this helps you do it to a degree perhaps that you've never been able to do before that type of focusing of attention bang like that now you can change that just a little bit by in turn again using hemisync and then move into a physical pattern of stimulating physical activity and that's why uh, again, focusing of attention on physical activity in sports, for example. And uh, we have an application that we used in golf that uh, uh, the one, the best example we know, the president of this national, uh, excuse me, state um, uh, golf association sliced 11 strokes off his score just by using this. It's that kind of thing. But it is because it let him focus his attention on 
the physical activity. Then you move, and you can see something's taking place here, that you can then move that focus of attention in many different ways. Uh, you, it's great because you can take that whole uh, skein of wakefulness and use it in a number of different ways. Then the next thing that importantly takes place is that you can shift that attention, that, that mind consciousness, into other types of states. All the way down, and you're not even asleep yet. <laughs> so look at this. And there's all of these in between. And we have some very profound ones that we've developed that, uh, mind you, you're not, you're not asleep, but you are awake. So we have a state that we can achieve by hemisphere that let your mind be awake and your body asleep. Now that means that the characteristics of your body, your physical body, are asleep. And this makes a very, very great discovery available to you. And that is that you don't need all that physical sensory input of your five senses to be awake, to be able to think to be conscious. And that's a great, great discovery because we always think we have to have all this physical sensory input in order to think we don't need it. And that's a big discovery. And Hemisy lets you get there very easily to learn that important pattern. So that's an illustration. In between these things are various states of consciousness that say that that let the psychiatrist or the analyst reach in and get into the various depths of that other part of that patient to find out what his problems are and let them surface because he establishes different means of getting into them like that, but they're not the same as that strictly mind, awake, body, asleep. This hemisync pattern will let you do that. So you can see the, the scope of, I'm speaking, it's anything that the mind can do, Hemisync lets it, uh, lets you, help you do that by changing the focus of attention, the focus of consciousness. So you see, one of the things that begins to emerge here is through the use of these sound patterns, uh, we can help, not force, uh, the mind to get into these other ways of thinking, if you put it that way, these other ways of perceiving. And uh, as I'm prone to say, that the whole concept that I found in out of body is past this wall we call sleep. Because we think of sleep as unconsciousness. And we have all these other forms of being unconscious. And sleep is the most common of those unconscious states. So what we're doing, utilizing this hemisphere, is to let the individual have for the first time control over his consciousness. And in relation to that, one of the key things that we have found is that this can, once we help a person learn this particular state, he in turn is as if he can restore that at will. He can, uh, he has a memory of it and he can recall it. It's as if you can recall when you were uh, let's say dancing in the dark if you want or whatever that you can recall it and there it is again so if you have a given state created by hemisync you remember the effect and you can be that again very important so if you take that perspective you can see that uh, there is no limit and steadily all the time there are various uses found for this different pattern and there are multiple patterns we're so far beyond just one little signal doing something uh, in our latest approach to it we each what we had as one signal is now seven signals and we may have as many as five of those one signals that were seven so we now have something like 35 different hemisync signal patterns on one application or one use. So we've gotten very deep into it. But the whole point that's so significant to us is what has emerged out of all of this. 
what has come out is that, first of all, because bear in mind that we have long ago gone past, quite naturally, because I demanded it, I needed the answers. So we went past this thing, this unconsciousness called sleep, to find out what was happening later on, where uh, we are not uh, getting too much signals from the physical body. What's happening out there? And there was an important thing came out of it. And that is that consciousness and is a continuum. It does not stop when we lose consciousness here. If we are not conscious here, we are conscious there, whatever there is. I don't pretend to say what that definition of there is, but we are there. So that means very simply when you're, you go to sleep here, you don't lose consciousness. You just shift along the spectrum of consciousness to another kind of wakefulness. This is, this is, um, and we in turn, with this consciousness, attempt to understand that phasing, that part of human consciousness at work there. And it's very difficult. So we try it and use dreams and all sorts of things to try and attempt to understand that consciousness, that, that being there, again, whatever there is. And out of that, saying that we don't know how far that spectrum of consciousness goes, that long band, it's, it's, it's endless. And we call that the interstate. What are we doing? Well, you see, that's the important thing, is we let our left brain get into the act and say, what are we doing? We let our intellect not just our imagination, but our intellect get in and say, what are we doing? Well, we finally got around to thinking we have a pretty good way of defining, of stating what we're doing. And that is that we as humans, and let's take the simple ratio of, of here we are now, and we are focused our attention in time-space, and we are very much... Uh, say, if you were watching this particular film, you would be focused your attention here. And that is that type of phasing. We are in phase with time-space. Now, if you don't look away from the TV or something and are thinking about what you will do tomorrow morning when you get up, you are a little bit out of phase because you're not concerned with this here now you are thinking about, you are thinking and doing nothing but thinking. And when you do that, then you're a little bit out of phase with time-space. So you can get the patterns of phase relationships. You're still here, but and your consciousness is uh, not only here in your physical self, but you're a little bit out of phase. And as you do this a little bit more, you get beyond inattention, you have what we call daydreams. So you're are focused very much in your mind here, but your body's here, and you know your body's here, and you know you're still in time-space. And so there is a phase relationship. Say, 60% of you is still in your physical consciousness, and 40% is over here daydreaming somewhere. And if you move it a little bit more, you get into such things as out-of-control phasing that are caused by uh, alcohol, for example, and you're drunk or uh, uh, drugs, and you're all on some drug high. And it's all uncontrolled, though. It's tremendously uncontrolled. And you can't start it and stop it, but you're out, uh, out of control. But you're out of phase. So you are perceiving two things at once, the out-of-control stuff here, and you have physical matter. And there begins the other very serious question, is that the person who has dementia or some form of psychosis, is in a dual phase relationship and cannot differentiate between the time-space physical phasing and this other that he perceived. So he sees little men and he hears voices and all kinds of things that are, are coming to him from this other phase relationship and he can't explain. And so he tries to mix the two to the degree that they are both the same thing when they're really not the same thing. So he goes into a mental hospital or they give him drugs like beta blockers to stop this other phasing. 
So if you think of that moving onward out through there, you can see what I mean by phasing. I can probably say, take a piece of paper and say, uh, this, for example, is a, is a phase relationship, and that's totally focused. Can you see it on the camera there? That's pretty good, isn't it? You don't have to focus the tight, but just get the angle. Now, as this, I turn this, this is moving slightly out of phase. So you have difficulty seeing the print more and more until this way it's very narrow. You could not even uh, define what that is. It's just a line there. And if you're trying to read this, you're having great difficulty because you can't even see it at all now. Now you're seeing another type of something. Uh, you're seeing not this, but something else. So you're completely out of phase of time-space. So it's that type of thing. Of these are ratios, and everything is ratio in terms of consciousness. The interesting part, of course, is that uh, we have certain fascinating things. And that is that uh, when uh, there comes a point, uh, we all face, there are certain things like death and taxes we all have to face. Well, one of them we have is facing physical death. And that means that this mm -hmm. tuning device that we have uh, called a physical body doesn't work anymore. So we have to phase out of it. And we're completely out of phase, and this doesn't work, so we are totally there again. Our consciousness is not dependent upon this. Mm -hmm. It's over there. And being over there is, uh, again, uh, a reality. And this is the thing that you begin to understand the more you get into this, that there is other realities which this mind that we have, this human state, can be conscious over in these other areas. And you can learn and do this long before you're forced to drop this physical body and go on. You can go play there. What is, fun. What is the yes. significance, Bob, of this ability that you've proven that we have to contact these other realities or other phases? I think the, uh, the most important thing, first of all, is to understand these ratios so that we can, we can begin to uh, just like we do with all of our our uh, physical sciences, classify uh, plants, uh, biological sciences, begin to classify these other states of consciousness as to what they really are and explore them. Why do that? Uh, the first and foremost thing uh, certainly comes out that uh, we around here have long gotten to the stage of, that we know we are more than our physical body. What does that mean? That means that you, uh, it doesn't make any difference what you do here, whatever you do. Uh, and uh, this is contrary to a lot of belief systems, no doubt about that. But whatever you do, uh, your performance, your behavior here, uh, doesn't mean whether you're going to exist or non-exist uh, after you die physically. You, you can be the, the a wonderful saint, or you can be the cruelest person you can think of, but you're still going to survive physical death. That's an automatic thing. And this process lets you begin to know that. Not believe it, but know it. And there's a great difference between believing and knowing. A huge difference. You can listen to me and say, I believe you. But if I give you the tools so that you can find this out and say, oh yes, now I know it. Think of the wonderful freedom that it would give you know that you survived death. Not believe it, but know it. Look how that would affect your life, that if you know that you survived physical death. This is one of the things that's very common in the use of hemisync. Eventually, people get to that knowing stage. They know that they survived physical death. It's great stuff. Because that lets you play here. That lets you live that much more fully, simply because uh, that thing that's controlled you so much in your life, the fear of death, no longer exists. Bob, given what you've been saying, what is the purpose of our playing here? What, what are we here for? Well, that's, that's absurdly easy. And I say absurd because uh, uh, it's so apparent once you begin to look at it with what I call a different overview from another perspective. Look at it. Um, it's best described as you, you come here as a, a vortex of energy, and I might add as an alien to this Earth life system. 
you don't belong here. So you try to change it. Man, humans try to change it. They don't like the way trees are planted, so they plant them in rows when this system says do it this way and they want it a nice tree. That's typical of humankind. But why do we come to this thing we call the earth and live on earth and be human? Very, very fascinating but obvious answer. And the more you look at it, the more obvious it becomes to you. And that is that you came here to learn. Now, what did you come to learn? These are nice, neat questions. What did you come to learn? You came uh, to learn a measurement system. This is a, a, a system of, of opposites, of polarities, uh, and we quickly give them labels like positive and negative, good, bad, and these kinds of things. We, we learn this measurement system, very important. We learn it, the system of measurement. And, uh, uh, and a great system of measurement that we learn is pain, pleasure. <laughs> And we know, how in the world could you know pleasure if you didn't know pain? The most boring thing that you could do is have a very even life with no pain or no pleasure. You couldn't stand it. You've got to have these, and we search for those, those pain and pleasure things. We go out of our way to do it. So if you think in terms of, of the whole concept of living here to learn measurements, now that's the first. The second is very interesting is that you learn to manipulate energy. I move my arms like this, my hands, I move my eyes and so on. I am using, I'm manipulating energy to do that. That's a, a, a use of five or six types of energy that let me move my arm. And we learn these very automatically. And I can tell you from deep personal experience that that simple ability that we take so much for granted of learning to manipulate energy is incredibly valuable in other energy systems. You'd be amazed how, how much value uh, that we think are ordinary things. Uh, keeping your balance, for example. We automatically learn how to stay balanced in this gravitic pattern. But over there, it's wonderful. You can use these kinds of things. So these are the two key things, but the most important thing of all. We came and we come here to learn and acquire an intellect. It's strange. An intellect. We acquire well, intelligence is not enough of the word. An intellect. An analytical ability. We come here to learn that. We use the metaphor left brain. We learn to acquire a left brain by living here and being here. That's the real valuable tool that we come and pick up. So you think that combination puts together um, uh, a being that is a super being, and that's true, except a terrible thinking happens, as they say, on the way to the store. Uh, we think we come and learn this, and we uh, think we will go and take off and go back where we came from. And I can say without any equivocation, no reservation, no conditioning, that everything, what little and is not much, I assure you, that I might have achieved so far is totally due to the imposition of my intellect upon what was taking place. Uh, instead of just flying around in the out-of-body state, after I knew it wouldn't kill me, I got curious. And the intellect got curious. What's going on here? What is this that's taking place? That was the difference. That brought, brought the whole thing in, into, into focus, into patterns, getting my analytical ability at work in it. And any, what little growth is due to that. Now, the funny thing is, that is, so, so now we gather all these things. We gather intellect, our measurement, knowledge, our uh, application of energy, and we're all, as I like to put it, going home with all this bag full of goodies, as it were, to take home and show the local boys how much you've learned and what you can do. Only, the only problem is that when we do this, 
uh, uh, we forget something that happens as again on the way to the store that we don't expect. What's that? Well, y if you know about it, then you can have fun. It's where you n don't know about it is where it gets dangerous, and that is that we become addicted to being human, and so after we exit this uh, this particular life sojourn. We're saying instead of going home and what I call having escape velocity to go home, something has happened in living that life. We've picked up a load factor. Uh, there was friction along the way, and that represents it. So instead of moving out and having escape velocity, we start turning around that, and it's our decision, no one else's. That's the important thing, our decision. We say, well, I think I'll go back just once more. And then this next time, I think I'll be a male instead of a female. That ought to be more fun. Just once more, and then I'll go home. So what happens is, instead of moving this way, we loop around and go back being a human again, and go back and have another human experience, another lifetime. And we come out again, and we're already this time. But this time we've had even a greater load factor, don't you see? We've slowed up a little more. We don't haven't got the speed that we did. We have a greater load, and so we're now in orbit, and we have a decaying orbit. Because when we come up around the orbit like this, instead of going on, we say, "Oh, I got to go back because you know, I I have never seen Paris, and I'd like to go to Paris for once in my life, and I'd like to just go there." So, whole purpose to go back and live again, so that I can go to Paris. And again, I've heard so much about Paris. I want to go to Paris, so I'll go and live again, so I can go to Paris. And as you can see, each time you pick up in each succeeding lifetime a greater load factor so that as you go through this, your orbit decays more and more as you go through this, living these successive lives until you get locked in tighter and tighter and tighter until you are locked in being human so tight that you forget where you came from. You've lost all of the desire to even depart and go home. You've lost it all because... This is so overwhelmingly addictive that you can't think of anything else but this time, space, physical matter, all the things that take place in there. And no matter how hard you try, you can't get away from it. And the reason being, there's no law. But when you, quote, die, and instead of going home, you make the decision. There's no law that says you have to stay here. You are the one who says, i got to go back. I, I didn't eat enough steaks. I didn't have enough strawberries. Uh, I didn't have enough children. All these kinds of things. Or I didn't have enough sex. <laughs> <Which> is, <laughs> anyway, that's how we, we lock in as being human. In so doing this, now the next trick is, well, what happens? Well, uh, why don't we recognize this more and more? Because we are so deeply addicted. So we develop uh, an excuse, uh, which you call belief systems, to rationalize this process, and but it's all done in this local traffic human terms. This is the difference. As a result, uh, somewhere along the way, you begin to find cracks in the belief system. You begin to find reasons that don't work quite well. That's the analytical thing coming into it. it says, "Hey, wait a minute, something wrong here. <laughs> this doesn't ways it doesn't work out. Two and two makes six. No, 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 wrong. Try again." You begin to find out that there are some holes in the cracks, and that's when you begin to regrow and begin to so that successively you begin to start on your way out again, and you begin to have a, a higher and higher orbit as you learn more and in these successive lives till finally you got escape velocity, and then you do go home. And that's what it's all about. Bob, are these very provocative ideas the result of your own analytical human mind, or is this information that has come from some source outside of your human mind? Uh, well, that's, <laughs> that, that's an interesting question. I would say probably, uh, I can't give you, I'm prone to make percentiles, and I don't know as I can give you an appropriate percentile. It is a combination. Obviously, through the years, uh, I've developed a lot of non-human friends. This one non-human friend, we got into the discussion of goals. And, uh, and he said, I, I, excuse me, I, 
I said, it's he, it's not true. Yeah, the, I don't know whether it's a he or a she, so I uh, developed a term, he, she. <laughs> so he, she uh, said, well, perhaps our goals are different. And I, in turn, said, well, I wouldn't think so. And he says, well, he, she says, uh, well, what is your goal? And I, thinking to be very noble and, and very spiritual, I said, well, my goals are dedicated to serving humankind. That's, that's what I want to do. And he, she said, Yes, that's a very noble goal, but there are other goals. And with that, I tried to find out. He says, well, there are other goals. That was a nice bait, a lure. And that got me curious and say, well, what other goals would there be? I thought that was a very noble goal. And this great enlightenment came to me uh, months later, years, who can tell, that there was another goal, and that goal is the one I was just perceiving, to go home. And I thought, what a wonderful idea it would be to go home. And, and to be the local boy who made good and goes back to his hometown with all the medals on his chest and his pockets full of gold and all these bags of tricks and go down the main street of the town and all everybody will say, oh, here he is, our hero's back. All this, you know, typical go-home type of thing. And so my, I had been home twice and had to be dragged back, kicking and screaming, as it were, from going home because uh, that was... Uh, not what I was supposed to do. So I knew what home was and symbolized to me. And so uh, I knew the goal was to go home. I knew what home was like, where I came from. And so my great, great joy was to prepare, to build, to go home. Oh, this is great, wonderful. And I had the goal. And for years I had that goal of going home, gathering all this everything I could gather that would be useful to have fun and teach people and do all sorts of things at home. As a result, um, I in turn thought, well, for a long time, and this was oh, maybe five or six years ago, something like that, um, I got into the pattern and was saying, well, and I asked this non-physical he, she friend, I said, you know, uh, and he was saying that was an also a nice new goal. He, uh, he always was very agreeable. That was a nice goal, too. That's mm, different from he was serving humankind. Go home. So I got into that. And uh, then uh, I asked him, because I didn't know how to do it uh, very well. So he taught me, he says, I'll show you how you can go home for a visit. I just wanted to get a little visit, you know, to stimulate me more, saying, oh, what a wonderful thing it would be to go home. And uh, so I wanted to get a taste of home again. And I knew what it was like. So he showed me how to do this, and I learned what I call the quick switch method from get from here to there. And it's, uh, it sounds weird, but it's as if one were to stretch a rubber band like that over to here, and then you let go of here, and you're there. <laughs> Click. like that. And I call it the quick switch method of getting somewhere. And as a result, in using this, uh, I suddenly was home, and uh, and the story of my getting this home thing was a very, very profound change, because I went and got home, and here were these, these the, the, that I remembered so beautifully, these, uh, this, they were huge, roiling clouds. And they were clouds had many, many different hues, bright colors within them, shifting like rainbow colors all through them. And you could lie in the clouds and it was and just observe this spectacle of of change. And it was not all round rolling. There were cubes and everything else, all sorts of types of different types of uh, symbol forms flowing round and through this. And you'd lie there and it's so beautiful. And then, as you were there, and I'm using time-space terms to express it because it's the only way you can do it. And as you would lie there, you would hear this tremendous music. And I interpreted it as music, but it was something else. But it was, of course, a form of vibration. But it ex expressed itself to me in music, beautiful, beautiful music, like a massive symphony orchestra beautifully conducted and over here was a magnificent choir of a thousand human voices and you're listening to all of this and in this return quick visit uh, I lay back in the clouds 
and looked at these beautiful patterns and heard this exquisite music. And I perhaps would have, might have stayed there forever, except what I had grown. And that was my left brain. Because I was lying there, and I looked at something, and my attention got caught. And what was it? And I, I, I looked again, perceived again, and it was right. Here was a pattern of clouds that went like this, for example, and then went on. And if you waited long enough, that same pattern of clouds came along, and it went like this and went on. It was a loop. It was a, a, a continuous loop. It was nothing new in the loop. If you get, The same thing came back again and again and again. And I then listened to the music. And sure enough, here is a beautiful melody line going... And if you waited long enough, the same instrument and the same melody line will be repeated. And with that, I sat up and had a great sigh of... Uh, and because I realized that then I knew why I had left home. Because I was bored. Uh, m there was nothing new to learn there. I was curious. I, and I was bored with watching the clouds do the same thing forever and listening to the music do the same thing forever. And I didn't want to stay there any longer. And that's why I left home. And uh, so one final thing. I, I, I realized that I was as if I had outgrown the glove and couldn't fit there anymore. And to be sure of this, because it was an overwhelming uh, sadness after de having devoted years of anticipation to going home. I went back and down in, and here's what I call curls, which are children playing games. And I had all these new games that I had learned being human and tried to teach them. And they says, we don't want your games. We've got our own games. We don't want it. I said, here's the newest. We don't want new games. And then sadly, I left. And um, I realized then that I truly had outgrown home, and I couldn't go home. Any, that, no, it wasn't possible for me to go home. So that goal was closed off. And uh, so you can, I, that was, I suffered quite a bit of depression from the fact that that goal was closed off to me. And to go back and serve humankind uh, was nothing. I couldn't go back to do that. So that left a big vacuum. And I could go on and tell you much about that vacuum, but I did find another answer, obviously, after uh, quite a long uh, pattern. Bob, will you tell us what this new goal is? Well, <laughs> it wasn't quite that simple. Uh, the new goal that uh, reawakened me out of this was, uh, as happens, I met another friend. And this other friend uh, I gave another type of name to simply because of the fact that I couldn't, uh, I could not, um, how to put it, I couldn't understand him in other, any him. It's a he, she again. Uh, and I didn't want to use the he, she name, so what I called this new friend was INSPEC, short for intelligent species, which meant that I was not an intelligent species. And uh, a very, very deep and warm relationship developed with this non-physical being, and I never saw him in a physical form. He didn't have a form. He was just an energy. And we had... Uh, and that went on for a number of years until suddenly, and my, oh, I must say there's another part to that. And I asked where his home was. And he said, would you like to go uh, and uh, on the way to my home? And I will show you. And I said, oh, my, yes, please, please. And so he did. And that became my new goal was to become an inspect. One of this, because the exquisite all the things with, that we express as being idyllic, love, joy, relationships, all these type of, of melding of unification was expressed when I went and just on the edges of this inspect's home. It was a beautiful, beautiful uh, goal to be that. And that became my goal, was to grow and be 
and inspect and 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 my plans all shifted to go to that state of being and uh, this inspect gave me so many different beautiful things such as escorting me into the future to see uh, my last time around as being human this kind of thing until one day uh, one night, one afternoon, I've forgotten exactly when, uh, the inspect in our particular meeting place, which was outside of time and space, uh, said to me, this is our last meeting. And I uttered a great shock, why? And the inspect said to me, because you are taking another path and you need to learn along that other path. And, and I said, well, will we see each other again? And he says, not in this form. And I said, is there, what have I done? Have I done it? He says, no, you have done nothing wrong. It's that you have gone in another direction and you have to learn that other direction and get back to basics before you can go any further. And in that, he the inspect winked out like that and was gone. And I went back maybe, oh, 25 or 30 times to that meeting place. And, he, and the inspect was never there. He had really disappeared. So that uh, occasioned another uh, depression, but it did trigger my left brain intellect, don't you see? That was the point. It triggered my left brain intellect to say, basics what's meant by basics and i started tracking down the basics of what i had missed apparently i'd missed something something uh, <clears throat> very very important and so i can it's needless to go through all the searching i trying to find what i had missed the basic and i went through the humans and then that was a learning procedure it took a long time to do no finally i came upon this one thing and that, was, that made the change. And that one thing was that many years ago, oh, about perhaps if we go into time, I will say in, a, in somewhere in the 60s, because of this consciousness, this I, this mind, didn't know what to do with this out-of-body activity, had no idea what to do with it. So uh, what I did is I used a a phrase, a term, an idea that we have as humans, that we have a total self. I don't like the word soul because it doesn't seem to fit. So I thought, I don't know what to do with this. I, to keep conducting experiments and going from Virginia to California was ridiculous. It was, and how many times can you go to Mars and to the outer planets? There's just more of the same. And so what I did, I finally said, wait a minute, the thing, the basic that I had missed was what I had been riding this vehicle, in other words I had been using this, this navigator and this driver, this vehicle all these years and I had not taken the trouble to find out who's doing the driving or as we in America put, what's under the hood of the thing I'm driving? And so I did. I began saying that is a basic and in looking at that basic I opened a whole new pattern of finding out what that answer was and that's a long thing but that in turn did move me in a totally different direction and brought me to the knowledge that anything that I could conceive of now as a goal was inadequate to what the options or the availabilities are after I have graduated as being human. And that's, that, is the, that is the limitation that I see that humans place upon we, and I was a part of it, probably still am as a matter of fact. We place upon ourselves by our belief systems. We think that's only certain things that we can do, quote, after we leave here and are non-physical, we forget these other very simple patterns that these are all based on 
on local ideas, local ways of thinking and doing, or even what we call intelligence, uh, is only a very human system of measurement. And here are all these things, and they were they suddenly, by this process, opened up to me to discover what the graduate human, uh, the being who graduates from this human system of learning can be. And that's what I mean by when I say go on the interstate. The, the goals are so spectacular, so far beyond anything that we can even consider, that uh, they, uh, they are prime targets for what, anyone who has curiosity, which I do. Uh, prime targets who, uh, of, of the scientists to get into something where the real action is. You run out of action in, in time space. There's a limit, but there's no limits in this. In this whole spectrum of consciousness that I say, that's what I'm talking about. How far does it go? I don't know how far it goes, but I do know one thing. That one of the routes that you can go, and that was one of my explorations, because I went and explored all this to see these potentials. One is that um, one route that you can take, and and you can see the source of this, and this is a lot of uh, the human kind. We all have a, a yearning, and we express it in, in the desire to go home. We express it in our, our going outward, in affinity, looking for other intelligent life, looking for things out in, in the universe, all these kinds of things. But the real part of it is we really want to do this key thing. We're looking for something else. And what we're looking for is the thing that's built into us from the beginning. Uh, and that is that, uh, and we express it in our religions, we would like to go meet our Maker. Now, uh, all I can tell you is that, that uh, at, the, at the very least, because this could go on for a long, long time, uh, I know how one could get on the interstate to go meet your Maker. And all I want to do, I have not met that maker yet, but what I would like to do uh, at some point, and that totality of me, and that's another story, uh, we would like to go uh, and, quote, not prostrate ourselves at the foot of our maker, but um, uh, let's say to shake that maker's hand and say what a magnificent um, engineer he is, what a beautiful designer he is, uh, she is, he, she, and and go get into a a new game with the maker, and that's only one of and it seems endless options that one can take. You can be a maker yourself if you want. What you learn here are the basic tools.